To introduce our speakers and give us a little bit more information on this webinar series, we have Anne Kinsinger, who is with the USGS Associate Director for Ecosystems with us today. Welcome, Anne. Wanted to invite you to join us. You can turn your camera on and unmute yourself, and I'll let you take it away. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. I want to thank everybody for joining us for the second session of a five-part webinar series on Indigenous Knowledges. I'm Ann Kinsinger. I'm the Associate Director for the Ecosystem Missionary of the U.S. Geological Survey, but more importantly for our call, I have served on the interagency working group that developed the federal guidance that we're going to be talking about today. Our meeting is hosted by the USGS National Climate Adaptation Science Center in partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Conservation Training Center, the USGS Office of Tribal Relations, and the Climate, climate Adaptation Science Center's Tribal Climate Re Resilience Liaisons. In our first session, which I hope you were able to join, our speakers, Melanie Montano of the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission and Daniel Wildcat of the Haskell Indian Nations University uh, spoke to us about what are indigenous knowledges. If you missed that, um, don't fret, because <laughs> all of the sessions are being recorded and will be posted to the website once the series ends. Now in this second session of the webinar series, we turn our focus on understanding the federal guidance on engaging with indigenous knowledges. So as you may know, in December of 2022, the White House released this first of its kind federal government wide guidance on how federal agencies can ethically acknowledge and include indigenous knowledges into science management and decision making. I had the privilege of representing USGS on that working group that developed the guidance. And I'm really pleased to welcome colleagues from this working group as our speakers today. Haley K. Scott of the White House Office of Science Technology Policy and Paige Smith of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. We hope this series is gonna be really informative to anybody who's interested in indigenous knowledge, knowledges. And through this series, we especially seek to elevate federal employees understanding of indigenous knowledges. And that's in order to build better partnerships with indigenous peoples. The series is also intended to assist tribal citizens and indigenous people seeking to understand the resources and opportunities that are available to them for collaborating with federal partners. We know there's still a lot of work to do to ensure indigenous knowledges are included into science planning and implementation processes, and that this is done in a meaningful and respectful way that facilitates trust with tribal and indigenous partners. This guidance is one step in a journey to recognize and promote indigenous knowledge as, as valid and valued forms of evidence for inclusion in federal policy, research, and decision making. So I really hope you enjoy today's session, and I invite you to join us for the remaining sessions uh, related to indigenous knowledges, um, some case studies, best practices, and the like. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you. Sarah, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Thank you. Uh, say goose while we goose, Sarah Smith Uh, My name is Sarah Smith, and I work out of the College of Menominee Nation as the Midwest Tribal Resilience Liaison and associated with the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. And I'm here today um, and very privileged to introduce our speakers. Uh, so our first speaker we have today is Haley K. Scott. Haley is a member of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians and a descendant of the Klamath Tribes, the Yurok Tribe, and the Sakagan Band of Chippewa Indians. She currently serves as the Policy Assistant for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policies, or OSTP, Climate and Environment Team. Uh, our second speaker today is Paige Schmidt. Uh, she works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service headquarters in science applications and the National Native American Programs, where she serves as the Indigenous Knowledge and Co-Stewardship Coordinator. Paige is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation of Oklahoma. And we wanted to take a moment to talk about the icon we have for the series. Um, this was developed by Coral Avery. Um, out of the BIA Tribal Climate Science, Climate Resilience Program um, and the Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. 
this image itself was put together um, by Coral with suggestions from our planning committee. And what we tried to do is, although we cannot fully encapsulate all of the indigenous um, peoples, we tried to include images from around um, Turtle Island um, to represent indigenous peoples. And it's meant to connect um, show the connection of native species and indigenous cultures stretching across Turtle Island from the Pacific Islands to the East Coast. And it includes the medicine wheel to symbolize the health and prosperity of people and the environment. Um, so Turtle Island, which you see the image of the turtle in the middle, symbolizes um, North America or both North and South America, um, depending on who's telling the story and where they're from. Uh, and you'll see that the water surrounds the image as well, um, which sustains life. And so all of this um, was put together by Coral in a beautiful image. Uh, and the inspiration was taken from Native storytelling and personal connections um, that the members of our planning committee uh, were able to share with one another. So with that, I want to turn it over to our presenters. All right. Um, so hello, everyone. Thanks to the team here uh, for introducing me. I'm very grateful to be here with you all today um, and very excited to tell you about the government-wide guidance on Indigenous knowledge. Uh, so before I get started, uh, just a little bit about where I'm coming from. So the mission of the Office of Science and Technology Policy is to maximize the benefits of science and technology to advance health, prosperity, security, environmental quality, and justice for all Americans. OSCP also provides advice to the president and the executive office of the president on all matters related to science and technology. They also steward the creation of bold visions, unified strategies, clear plans, wise policies, and effective, effective equitable programs for science and technology, working with departments and agencies across the federal government and with Congress. OSTP also works to engage with external partners, including tribes, industry, academia, philanthropic organizations, civil society, and state and local and territorial governments and other nations. And finally, OSCP works to ensure inclusion and integrity in all aspects of science and technology. So before I jump into talking about the guidance itself, I just wanted to give a little bit more background about who I am and where I'm coming from, because it's important to me. So again, Haley, I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of Sluts Indians and the Klamath Tribes, Yurok Tribes, Kungaman Chippewa. I grew up in the Klamath Basin in Southern Oregon. Uh, so I included some pictures of my homelands just because I miss it very much here while I'm working in DC. Uh, so at the top you see Crater Lake and at the bottom that's the upper Klamath Lake with a few of the Cascade Mountains in the background. I went to the University of Oregon and got my Bachelor of Arts degree in political science and a minor in Native American studies and go Ducks. Um, a lot of my background includes tribal engagement, consultation, and environmental and climate justice grassroots organizing. And finally, I am the oldest sister of three younger siblings who I am very proud of. They are making their way into their careers and just getting started. So I'm just happy that I get to be their sister. And so uh, before, again, I jump into the presentation, I did wanna provide a brief background on terminology and definitions. So as most of you probably know, there is not one term that encapsulates the knowledge held by tribes, indigenous peoples, and communities. There are a few different terms that are used to describe or refer to the, the cultural, natural, historical, and present knowledge and life ways, including traditional ecological knowledge, traditional knowledge, and indigenous knowledge. And stories are also used dependent on the context, place, and the person that you're talking to. But for the purposes of my presentation, um, you'll likely hear me uh, consistently use the term indigenous knowledge, but just know that I'm, I recognize that this isn't the only term that exists. So why did we do this? So the purpose and goals of the indigenous knowledge guidance is to one, achieve a more equitable and inclusive process and evidence based in federal actions. Two, to respond and act on requests from tribal leaders to include indigenous knowledge and in federal decision making. And three, to stay aligned with the President's Racial Equity Executive Order, so EO 13985, and Presidential Memos on Tribal Consultation and Consultation Standards. 
So it is a priority of the Biden administration to make respect for tribal sovereignty and self-governance, a commitment to fulfilling federal trust and treaty responsibilities to tribal nations, and regular, meaningful, and robust consultation with tribal nations as cornerstones of the federal Indian policy. So this commitment has launched several efforts, including a recommitment to Executive Order 13175, and it requires, sorry about that, and it requires each agency to prepare and periodically update a detailed plan of action to implement the policies and directives of that executive order. So just quick background, just in case, I think it's important because um, it is uh, one of the mechanisms that really informed the guidance. So in 2000, President Clinton signed EO 13175 as a means to establish regular and meaningful consultation and collaboration with tribal officials and the development of federal policies that have tribal implications. And so tribal implications are defined as having substantial direct effects on one or more Indian tribes, on the relationship between the federal government and Indian tribes, or on the distribution of power and responsibilities between the federal government and Indian tribes. And it requires the federal government to consult with federally recognized tribal nations on policies that affect them. One second. Okay, so the Biden-Harris administration hosted its first White House Tribal Nation Summit in November 2021, and among several announcements and discussion topics that were included in the event, President Biden announced the White House initiative to elevate the role of Indigenous knowledge in federal decision making. And so again, this effort was motivated by requests from tribal leaders for the federal government to issue guidance around IK and comes as part of the administration's commitment to strengthen relationships with tribal nations and native communities. So this effort was led jointly by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Council on Environmental Quality. So OSTP CEQ, we released a memorandum at the 2021 Tribal Nation Summit that announced a commitment and process to elevating Indigenous knowledge and federal decision making. So the guidance development process involves tribal consultations and public and expert input opportunities to ensure that Indigenous knowledge holders, scholars, and other relevant stakeholders meaningfully shape the process and outcome. So the guidance development process included an interagency working group with more than 25 federal agencies and departments represented. Um, and so this isn't an exhaustive list on here, but I wanted to give you a sense of the breadth and depth of agency expertise that was involved in this effort. And I just have to say from experience with being able to work with this group, everyone who was a part of it was very engaged and very excited, which made me excited and which just made this work really easy to do or at least be a part of. So I just wanted to make that note as well. Um, so also I'll just love highlighting who my teammates here are uh, at CEQ and OSTP. So we have Alani Wilhelm, who serves as our Assistant Director for Ocean Conservation. Dr. Larry Hinsman serves as our Assistant Director for Polar Sciences. Dr. Rachel Daniel, our Deputy Director of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee and Policy and Advisor for Indigenous Knowledge. Nasheen Iqbal, Deputy Director for Forest and Equity at the Council on Environmental Quality. And Justice, uh, Justin Padot, General Counsel with CEQ. So at the December 2022 White House Tribal Nations Summit, the first in-person summit to take place in six years, OSTP Director Dr. Provoker and CEQ Chair Mallory jointly released the new government-wide guidance and an accompanying implementation memorandum for federal agencies on recognizing and including Indigenous knowledge and in federal research, policy, and decision-making. This announcement coincided with the Biden-Harris administration's 2022 Tribal Nations Summit in response to the 2021 OSTP CEQ memorandum that called for the development of the guidance with tribal consultation and indigenous community engagement. So over 300 tribal leaders were in attendance. So before I uh, talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the guidance, I wanted to give a quick snapshot at the numbers. So to develop the guidance, OSTP and CEQ engaged more than 100 tribes, 1,000 individuals and organizations, and involved over 25 plus federal agencies in the development process. We also hosted three tribal consultations, two Hawaiian and Pacific Islander roundtables, a native and indigenous youth roundtable, one public listening session, and before finalizing the guidance, we released a draft to tribes prior to the third consultation to help guide our feedback. 
Okay, so jumping into it. So the guidance one aims to provide an overview and one understanding of Indigenous knowledge. So the first section provides a set of definitions and characterizes Indigenous knowledge as a valid form of evidence for inclusion in federal policy, research, and decision-making. The guidance also encourages federal agencies and departments to grow and maintain the mutually beneficial relationships with tribal nations and Indigenous peoples needed to appropriately include Indigenous knowledge. So this section of the guidance outlines promising practices, or at least some promising practices for early and sustained engagement and be, uh, building meaningful relationships. It also encourages the consideration of co-management and co-stewardship of lands and waters with tribes and Indigenous peoples. So the guidance also lists some promising practices for inclusion of Indigenous knowledge in federal processes and suggestions on how to appropriately engage around sensitive Indigenous knowledge systems and practices. The text also lists specific processes where Indigenous knowledge can be included in federal research, policy, and decision making. So that includes rulemaking, research design, grant making, and other federal funding opportunities, and highly influential scientific assessments, such as the National Climate Assessment. So I wanted to, second. So the guidance also uh, identifies statutory authorities that can assist agencies to protect and apply indigenous knowledge and collaborate with the tribes and indigenous peoples who possess it. So these include the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, the Information Quality Act, Evidence Act, National Historic Preservation Act, and the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Okay, so I wanted to bring attention specifically to Appendix C of the guidance, which covers the process in which Indigenous knowledge was assessed in the National Climate Assessment, just as one example. So in the NCA, uh, we included a checklist that was used by the United States Global Change Research Program in the development of that assessment. The survey was developed based on the requirements found within the Information Quality Act, which one requires agencies to verify that data and information used in federal products and reports are of a sufficient quality for the purposes they are being used, with quality defined as utility, transparency, objectivity, and integrity. This includes the requirement for information to demonstrate a capability of being reproduced by independent assessment or analysis using similar methods. So the draft survey here shown, uh, I think just provides one example of how a federal, a federal body, so USGCRP, worked to ensure that indigenous knowledge was considered in the National Climate Assessment Development and was consistent with the Information Quality Act. So the survey was developed as an update to the guidance process for the authors of the NCA. Topics considered in the checklist included transparency and traceability, objectivity, integrity and security, and reproducibility. So Appendix A provides 16 examples as well that illustrate mutually beneficial collaborations that are possible between agencies and tribal nations and indigenous peoples. These examples include input from and reflect the perspectives of the indigenous organizations, individuals, and agencies involved in these particular efforts. And so again, just wanted to highlight a few specific examples related to climate, including the National Climate Assessment. So each of the 10 regional chapters in the fourth National Climate Assessment includes at least one example of climate impacts or adaptation practices unique to tribes and indigenous peoples, many of which are based on indigenous uh, knowledge local to that region. Other examples of the application of indigenous knowledge and federal climate related decision making includes the listing of species under the Endangered Species Act, the habitat designation, uh, decisions made by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA and consideration of indigenous knowledge in the Bureau of Indian Affairs Climate Resilience Investments. I also wanna highlight the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area, which was established by Executive Order 13754 in 2016 and then reinstated by President Biden in 2021 through Executive Order 13990. So this EO established, uh, established a federal task force and tribal advisory council. So the task force and TAC are charged with conserving the region's ecosystem, including those natural resources that provide important food security to the people of the region. 
the tribes, regional Alaska Native nonprofit organizations, elders, and traditional knowledge holders from across the Northern Bering Sea region are working with the federal government to address concerns about rapid climate change and the need for solutions that take a whole of government approach to build equity into decision making for the Northern Bering Sea region. You can see here there's quite a few other examples that I encourage everyone to take a look at in the guidance. I won't read them all off here uh, just for the sake of time. And uh, so next slide. And so finally, I just wanted to quickly highlight the rest of the appendices included in the guidance. So in Appendix B, uh, we list select federal agency guidance documents on indigenous knowledge as a resource. Appendix D, uh, federal departments and agencies contributing to the interagency working group on indigenous knowledge are listed. Appendix E offers additional references and resources for promising practices to apply when considering indigenous knowledge in federal processes and Appendix F, uh, which lists additional resources for considering Indigenous knowledge in federal research design and implementation contexts. So moving forward, um, the, the memo that was released at the 2022 Tribal Nations Summit calling for the implementation of the guidance helped launch the new subcommittee on Indigenous knowledge under the National Science and uh, Technology Council. And so the, the new subcommittee is tasked with coordinating guidance implementation with the White House Council on Native American Affairs, and it serves as a community of practice and shared learning space for agencies. And it also helps us to continue work around indigenous knowledge and federal decision making in a meaningful way. Um, and so the memo, the implementation memo also called for agency progress reports on guidance implementation, which is due in 180 days since the day of release. So the NST subcommittee on indigenous knowledge will use these progress reports to identify and help address cross cutting challenges and coordinate implementation. Um, and just a little bit more about who the NSTC is. So they are a cabinet level council of advisors to the president on science and technology. And they are tasked with coordinating the ST policy making process and ensuring that the ST policy decisions and programs are consistent with the president's policies priorities. And so uh, just one more detail, uh, the subcommittee, it sits within the NSTC Council's Committee on the Environment, Natural Resources and Sustainability. And although that's very specific, I think that this subcommittee on indigenous knowledge has a lot of opportunity to think outside the box. And so, to end, I just wanna note that the guidance and implementation memo is one step, and we're looking forward to working with federal agencies and departments, tribes and indigenous peoples, and the new NSDC subcommittee on ensuring that this work continues. So with that, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, and I will stop screen. Okay, I believe now I am passing on to the next speaker. Thank you, Haley. That was a wonderful talk to follow. And um, when I realized that I was going to be speaking after Daniel and Melanie kicked off this series a few weeks ago, I was joking with the planning team that I didn't think a talk about policy was going to generate a steady stream of heart reactions that their talk did. Um, but it's still an honor to follow their presentation and to follow the wonderful presentation you just gave on the great work happening to provide government-wide guidance on Indigenous knowledge. Now I'm happy to discuss efforts to develop policy on indigenous knowledge for the Department of Interior. I wanted to start by providing an overview of what a departmental manual is and what the forthcoming manual on indigenous knowledge, how it has been developed. So a departmental manual is essentially a user manual for the Department of Interior and provides the organization function and authorities for the department and guidance on how to implement these requirements. 512 DM4 is an example of a department, departmental manual for the interior on how we should consult with tribes. The forthcoming uh, departmental manual on indigenous knowledge establishes the responsibilities for considering and including indigenous knowledge in Department of Interior's actions and scientific research. The forthcoming manual came about through efforts of the Department of Interior's Climate Task Force. There was a climate coordination working group, which um, consists of um, heads of each of the agencies representing uh, their agency in a policy review. And the point of this policy review was to strengthen DOI policy procedures and guidance on use of appropriate climate informed decision frameworks and models for future resource management decisions. 
It was also tasked to review and develop updates to existing departmental manuals and support development of associated guidance via sub working groups. When the policy review was uh, started, it was initially thought that indigenous knowledge would be incorporated into each of four climate related departmental policies, but it was then determined that the department needed a standalone chapter for indigenous knowledge. In order to do that, a sub working group was assembled with representatives from each of the Department of Interior bureaus to kick off this process in June of 2022. While not every bureau is represented, the vast majority of them are including the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Bureau of Reclamation, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, the National Park Service, the Office of Surface Mining, Reclamation and Enforcement, my agency, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the U.S. Geological Survey. Each agency identified policy interests and needs for inclusion in the Departmental Manual on, Interior, on Indigenous Knowledge. A writing team was stood up and tasked with crafting an initial draft, which incorporated all of the comments received by the Office of Science and Technology Policy and Council on Environmental Qualities, listening sessions and consultation processes. This was important so that individuals that provided um, information into that process didn't have to repeat those efforts. We also incorporated the draft uh, government-wide guidance into our initial policy. Once the draft was developed, it was sent for internal review in fall of 2022, and we started consultations in February of this year. The tribal consultation comment period has ended in March 26 of this year, and we are in the process of scheduling informal listening sessions for indigenous communities of US territories. So um, all comments that have been received specific to the manual will be incorporated into a final version um, that we expect to release at the first quarter of fiscal year 24, which roughly translates into the end of um, November of 2023 or in time for the um, next potential White House Tribal Nations Summit. So just as a caveat, everything presented here is draft and subject to change prior to finalization of the policy. So the Department of Interior's policy on indigenous knowledge discusses indigenous peoples, which include Native Americans, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and indigenous peoples of the US territories. The policy recognizes there is no singular definition of indigenous knowledge, but there are universal concepts generally agreed upon that are used to describe indigenous knowledge. It also acknowledges that the description of indigenous knowledge may change and evolve over time. So I apologize for reading these, this description, but the words have been very carefully chosen. Um, and so I wanna make sure that they are conveyed exactly as they are um, in the draft policy. So the policy describes indigenous knowledge as a body of observations, oral and written knowledge, innovations, technologies, practices, and beliefs developed by indigenous peoples through interaction and experience with the environment. It is applied to phenomena across biological, physical, social, cultural, and spiritual systems. Indigenous knowledge has been developed over millennia. It continues to develop, and it includes understanding based on evidence that has been acquired through direct contact with the environment and long-term experiences. It also includes extensive observations, lessons, and skills that are passed from one generation to the next. Indigenous knowledge has been developed, held, and stewarded by Indigenous peoples and it is intrinsic within indigenous people's legal traditions, including customary law or traditional government governance structures and decision-making processes. The policy acknowledges that other terms such as traditional knowledge or knowledges, traditional ecological knowledge, genetic resources associated with traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expression, tribal ecological knowledge, native science, indigenous applied science, indigenous science, and others are sometimes used to describe this knowledge system. While the departmental manual uses indigenous knowledge throughout, the terminology and descriptions of indigenous knowledge preferred by the group someone is working with should be used. Next, I'd like to highlight a few of the, uh, some highlights of the policy. 
So it is consistent with the OSTP CEQ guidance for federal departments and agencies on indigenous knowledge. It elevates indigenous knowledge and in implementation of department activities. And it stresses that collaborative relationships with indigenous peoples must be built on reciprocity, equity, and mutual respect. It also requires free prior and informed consent must be obtained before learning or including indigenous knowledge in departmental activities or research. The policy states that you should learn indigenous knowledge through appropriate processes and procedures that are in collaboration with indigenous peoples. And that indigenous knowledge should be included in a manner that is compliant with federal laws, including the Information Quality Act, which Haley gave the example of. The policy ensures that departmental employees receive training on learning and including indigenous knowledge before they engage. And that bureaus and offices will develop further guidance for inclusion of indigenous knowledge that is specific to their missions. It also establishes new departmental indigenous knowledge coordination committee. So what's next? The departmental manual is our policy and it tells us what we should do, but it doesn't tell us how to do it. So in, as we are in the process of adjudicating comments received through consultation and anything that we learned through the informal um, listening sessions for the indigenous communities of the US territories, we have also stood up two teams to develop, uh, one team will be tasked with developing a departmental handbook. And the handbook essentially contains the guidance and best management practices for how to implement the policy. And a second team will be responsible for developing a training framework. In addition, each agency or bureau may need to develop policy and guidance on indigenous knowledge that is specific to their mission. They may need to um, create a new standalone policy on indigenous knowledge or incorporate it into existing policies. As an example, a service manual 510 FW10 is the US Fish and Wildlife Service's Native American policy, which currently includes indigenous knowledge. The sections of this policy on indigenous knowledge may need to be modified or amended to be consistent with this new departmental uh, policy. They may also need to incorporate this policy into um, examples of how they would implement agency specific missions, such as um, the Endangered Species Act or the National Wild Management of the National Wildlife Refuge System. And then, of course, specific to that, they would need to develop their own guidance, training, and then implement their own policies. So, with that, I will say miigwech or thank you, and I will turn it over for um, questions. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Haley and Paige. I'm Elda Berlaminger with the US, USGS National Climate Adaptation Science Center, and we'll be uh, going through the questions that you presented. Thank you, everyone, for those who uh, already submitted questions. And if you'd still like to submit a question, feel free to do so through the QA. So, going through some of our questions, um, the biggest one we'll just get out of the way. <laughs> Folks were very interested in your PowerPoint slides. <laughs> and the links shared. And so if you're comfortable and you can consider this, um, folks just want to know if we'll make those available. I will uh, say that we are recording this and the recording will be made available within the next two to three weeks. We just have to do some formatting for our uh, platform to, for it to be, meet certain criteria. Um, but yes, uh, would you be comfortable at least sharing some of those links? But there was so much information shared, I'm sure people just want to make sure they aren't missing anything. Yep, thanks, Elder. Wonderful. Yep, I'll, I'll send you a clean PowerPoint. Wonderful, thank you so much. And a couple of questions came up about the references there. Um, Haley, you mentioned some progress reports and uh, someone asked if those progress reports are made to the, available to the public or are they internal progress reports? I don't have uh, an answer right now that's probably accurate. I think that's still something that we have to determine as a subcommittee. And so I think, I believe that will be up to uh, committee members at that time, but I imagine there will probably be opportunities to do report outs because um, that's something that we've been trying to do to, to keep things as transparent as we can, uh, but we do want to make sure that the subcommittee itself feels, feels good about sharing what we get in. But I imagine, yeah, we will most definitely um, have a report out. So sorry, I don't have an accurate question on, or answer on that. 
Thank you. I, someone was making mention that the White House number is government wide and, and uh, referred to the Department of Justice and wanted to know, does the guidance apply in litigation? I think it could. I mean, it seems like there's opportunity and I would definitely, if someone has an idea, I know that the subcommittee would probably be happy to hear it. Because um, like I said, although we're housed under the uh, Environment Committee within NSTC, I mean, I think there's definitely room for that to happen. And so, yeah, I think it could, right? Thank you. And can you speak more to how um, sorry. With some exception, it appears that indigenous knowledges, as referenced in this webinar, um, are mainly focused on tribes. Can you speak more to how these efforts and EOs acknowledge indigenous, indigenous knowledges in Pacific regions where there are no recognized tribes? Yeah, thanks for that question. And Paige, I don't know if you have anything to add, but I'll just say that we did um, make an effort to host two roundtables with uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Island island leaders because we, we heard from the very beginning that not only federally recognized tribes hold Indigenous knowledge, but Indigenous communities, elders, um, and specific people hold it as well. And so that's why we did the public listening session as well, just to try and reach more people. Um, and also hosting that Native and Indigenous Youth Roundtable, we were able to get some really good feedback and ideas and engagement with youth who didn't, some of them didn't come from federally recognized tribes. And so the guidance also recognizes that one best practice is to engage with uh, tribes that may not have ratified treaties or federal recognition and indigenous communities such as Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. I don't have anything to add to that. That was great, Haley. Thank you. Thank you. And you mentioned that there was a review uh, of the guidance done. Was that by tribes or tribal experts? Yeah, so we uh, sent out a draft of the guidance before the third and final consultation on the development process um, to tribal leaders. And so we worked with our with the White House Council on Native American Affairs and also our Domestic Policy Council here um, within EOP to get that out. And so because we, we wanted to make sure that we weren't just putting something out as the final you know, draft. And so I think that really helped um, shape things up and uh, gave us a really strong product. So yes, it was released to tribal leaders. And I will also say that we did do a lot of engagement with uh, representatives from intertribal organizations, just because um, we know that other experts could include folks from academia, uh, even just indigenous communities themselves. And so we tried to make sure that we worked with a couple of different networks in that process. Someone mentioned, I'd be curious to hear some exploration of the distinction between co-management and co-stewardship within the guidance. So I think that falls under the line of that terminology. So we did have some back and forth on what would be best to include, but I believe the guidance highlights both. Um, and there are probably examples included in those reference lists that I mentioned or the appendices at the end of the guidance document. Um, and so I would I would suggest looking there because I yeah, there was a long list. So off the top of my head, I can't tell you specifically where at in the guidance that that's mentioned. Um, but I, I believe that was definitely a point of um or a topic that was consistently brought up even in the in the travel consultation sessions and the um our other public engagement efforts so i think it's probably there's probably not one way to differentiate between the two right it's probably agency specific tribal specific and so um Paige, do you want to add anything to that you might have a better answer than me no um uh, there, I think that it, Haley's right that I think it applies in, in the context and that co-management is in certain instances legally defined um, in certain statutes. And so I think that would probably be the best point of reference. Thank you. Uh, and this is a question for a page. Will existing DOI U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service policies be required to undergo a formal review for compliance with this new policy? 
Can you, so are you asking if the policy will be, have to go through review for compliance with the policy or compliance with the guidance? So will DOI and Fish and Wildlife Service policies be required to undergo formal review for compliance with the new White House guidance is my read on this question. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there, every effort has been made so that there is consistency between the two. And that is one of the things that we are doing in the adjudication of the comments that we have received during the uh, consultation process is ensuring that if there were any points of discrepancy, because as, as two processes move along in parallel, Sometimes one can get in front of the other and, you know, you might have to make sure that they talk. So there is efforts being made, yes. Thank you. How does the White House guidance pertain to us in the universities, which are funded in part by federal programs? Yeah, thanks for that question. That's something we've been discussing quite a bit because um, best practice is engaging with multiple partners because sometimes that could help the process of better connecting with tribes or communities themselves. Um, and so again, just because this guidance document is very high level, it most likely depends on how agencies interact with their grantees. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for universities or folks from academia to participate in these types of conversations. And I really do think there's opportunity to work with uh, university partners to, I don't know, try and conduct or facilitate meaningful engagement um, and even implementation of projects if that's what helps a federal agency get their work done on the ground. But um, so yeah, again, I would say it's very agency dependent or specific. Um, Paige, do you, I wonder, do you have any examples maybe that you can cite as well? No, not off the top of my head, but I, I definitely think that working with universities and academics gives us an opportunity for bringing in subject matter experts and um, various different partnerships. Definitely, I think that there's a lot of um, opportunity there. Thank you. How does the reproducibility requirement of the Information Quality Act mesh with indigenous knowledge? Can you restate the question, although sorry. No problem. How does the reproducibility requirement of the Information Quality Act mesh with indigenous knowledge? And, and there was a related question that says, how does one show that indigenous knowledges can be included per the IQA, especially regarding reproducibility, when it might be knowledge developed over millennia, i.e. longer time periods than many research projects might currently allow? That provides more context. Yeah. So. I would probably have to send more information or follow up on that piece so I can connect with the actual person who gave us this example. I think they'd be more than happy to send more information because that's a really that's a really great question. Um, and so I would say one one piece of the reproducibility that was also taken into consideration with that example I highlighted was the continuity of the information taken and then validation of it. And so although I don't think um, Sorry, give me one second. Someone just walked in. <laughs> um, so I would also say another piece uh, in addition to that reproducibility was talking about our checking and considering the integrity and security of gathering that information. Um, so reproducibility just wasn't alone. So I imagine that was also another way that indigenous knowledge meshed into that. And then again, that draft survey that I mentioned, it also uh, asked about transparency and traceability. So making sure that there was relationality and clarity. Um, and then also talking or trying to uh, take into consideration objectivity. And so thinking about the context of where that knowledge is coming into play. Um, so that probably didn't answer the question, but that's that's what I can offer right now. Thank you. What kind of resources and support will be provided to federal agencies to develop their specific approaches? So yeah, I'm starting to feel bad, but I, I'll just have to say that, you know, this, this subcommittee is brand new. This indigenous knowledge guidance is brand new. And although that we know that indigenous knowledge has been around since time immemorial, um, 
I just keep have to say there's a lot of opportunity for new ideas. And so that's why I was really excited about this. And I'm so excited to see how many people were able to join. I think the NST subcommittee, NSTC subcommittee on indigenous knowledge would really like to hear from federal employees themselves. Um, what would be helpful? Would that look like training? And uh, you know, would it be agency specific training? Would it look like, would it be helpful for OSTP and CEQ to offer high level trainings on this? Um, and so, yeah, again, we're taking ideas. Uh, we just had our second meeting about a month ago. We're about to have our third meeting. We're still trying to figure out what can we do. Um, and so I think, yeah, definitely I'll put out a request for ideas and help. And I think I would like to put out a request for funding. <laughs> um, I think that we, um, not working at the funding level myself, but I think that it is you know clear to everybody involved in these efforts that this is, um, we will need re resources in order to do this um, effectively and ethically, and that it's something that we that we should do. And it's um, it's not really um, something new. We're essentially we are fulfilling our trust responsibility in part, and so I think it's important that we provide the resources that are necessary to do that. Thank you. I think related to that, uh, people are interested. Uh, and I'm interested in training my agency staff so that we can be better advocates for indigenous knowledges and apply it to our work. Are there resources or network agencies can turn networks agencies can turn to for these trainings? Can we do it in a way that's equitable for tribes and indigenous knowledge knowledges teachers? I can highlight um, a few specific resources that may be helpful and those are coming from those intertribal organizations and networks um, that I mentioned and I imagine my colleague here on the call Sarah Smith might have some ideas too or resources that could be offered but I'll just highlight like the intertribal um, sorry intertribal environmental I can't remember the acronym and I'm embarrassed because I bet some colleagues are on here but it's uh Institute for Tribal and Environmental Professionals. So excuse me, it's been a long day for me, but ITEP offers a lot of great resources and help and is a really good network or great network that I think federal agencies and departments can look to. Um, there are a lot of other regional intertribal organizations. So another one I can highlight is the Affiliated Tribes and Northwest Indians. They do offer some training opportunities or they have in the past that have included federal agencies and department staff. Um, and there are probably a lot other ones, but off the top of my head, yeah, those are some a few that I can highlight. And yeah, I just would say intertribal organizations and networks uh, can be a great resource because that's a lot, uh, a place where information sharing can happen as well. Um, I would just add that uh, there's um, five, I think that I'm not, Haley, correct me on the term that's being applied, but there's five working groups. One of them associated with the guidance is a essentially a, a um, community of practice or learning group. And one of the uh, current efforts is to serve as a clearinghouse for resources and training that's available. And so the training team for De Department of Interior that I mentioned, um, I'm actually heading that effort and I'm communicating with this other working group. And so one of the things that we plan to do is try to create an exhaustive list of um, resources and trainings that are available, whether those are uh, government trainings or those are um, outside of government, like the ones Haley just mentioned. And then from that information, so we aren't reinventing the wheel, we will develop, um, identify any training gaps that are necessary and then develop a training framework for that. But of course that's specific to Department of Interior, but um, I think that there is probably a lot of information out there and hopefully the uh, uh, interagency working group that is developing the clearinghouse will help um, shine a light on all the wonderful resources that are currently available. Thank you. And as we come to close, just one more question. Do you have a timeline on finalizing the handbook and rolling out the trainings? We The goal is to finalize the handbook at the same time that we finalize the policy. And right now, our timeline is around um, by the end of the calendar year of 23. And at that time, we hope to have a training framework um, developed. We won't necessarily have the full trainings developed, but we would at least like to know what the training needs are and what, what the contents of those trainings would be. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today to share all this information. And I know there were a lot of questions and some of them tough. I, I know it's early on and, and some things are still developing. So thank you for sharing what you, you were able to share today. And I'm sure many folks will be following to see what other guidance follows. Um, thank you to everyone who joined and, and supported our presenters today. And just a reminder that this is a second in a five-part series. It's uh, happening on a bi-weekly occurrence. And our next webinar in the series will take place on May 4th, focused on tribal policies around indigenous knowledges. So we hope to see you then. Thank you so much, everyone. And yes, these will be recorded and posted as soon within about the next three weeks. Thank you all again. Uh, miigwech, thank you.